<laughs> the temperature was just 10 degrees, with a wind chill well below zero. My eyes stung despite the sunshine, and I couldn't feel my fingers and toes. I was only 10 years old, and my father couldn't believe I actually wanted to be there. Dad, I reminded him, this is one of the greatest rivalries in all of sports. It was December 1989, and I had already loved the Chicago Bears for several years. Sadly, they lost on that frigid day, 40 to 28 to the hated Green Bay Packers. But it wasn't always that way. My love began in January 1986. After watching the Bears win Super Bowl XX, I got caught up in the excitement almost everyone in Chicago felt. I even memorized every word of the Super Bowl shuffle, from Walter Payton singing They Call Me Sweetness to Richard Dent's dominance as the sack man. It may have been a bit strange for a seven-year-old girl, but I had found a passion. Like any relationship, my connection with the Bears went through rough patches. I cried many tears over their playoff losses in the 80s, when it seemed they should have won at least one more championship. I mostly ignored them during my college years, a time when they never had a winning season. And just when I thought I was old enough to know better, as a young adult about to start my career, their 2001 team captivated me until they lost at home in the playoffs yet again. <laughs> Luckily, around that time, my love for the Bears helped me find a different kind of love. I was living on my own and lonely, a TV reporter in Peoria, Illinois. I didn't think much of it when a guy I worked with started talking to me a bit more. An interest in sports, football in particular, was something safe we had in common. One rainy November Sunday, he called to see if I'd like to watch the Bears game with him at a local bar. What could it hurt, I thought to myself. I wanted to watch the Bears game anyway. We shared a couple orders of hot wings and drank at least a couple beers. It even looked like the Bears would win the game. Until the New England Patriots, led by their new quarterback, Tom Brady, <laughs> took the lead with just seconds to go. The Bears lost, 33 to 38. Tom Brady, of course, was still playing in the NFL this past season more than 20 years after that Bears defeat. The guy I watched it with is still around too. He's been my husband for more than 16 years now. We've built a great life together, complete with two beautiful daughters. I'd like to think that all would have happened even if we hadn't bonded over the Bears, if my love for that team didn't help lead me to a much more important kind of love. I can't be sure, though. I do know my husband often wishes I didn't love the Bears quite so much, especially when he's right there with me through the heartbreak. My 40th birthday was January 6, 2019. My husband's gift to me was playoff tickets. The Bears versus the Philadelphia Eagles at Soldier Field. Oh. Our, seats, <laughs> our seats were in the north end zone, but we rarely sat down. We stood and cheered for most of the game, which came down to a Bears field goal attempt. A successful kick would mean a playoff win. You know what happens next. <laughs> <laughs> the Bears kicker missed. Double joint the ball off the goalpost, upright and crossbar. The game was over. I had watched the Bears lose yet again, this time in meme generating fashion. <laughs> I'm not proud to admit I booed and cried when that kicker ran off the field a few minutes later. It might seem like this love story involves mostly heartbreak, but that's not how I see it. The fact is, I get joy from every Bears victory, even when they're well out of the playoff race. Heck, I cheer for every touchdown and interception, even if the game is out of reach. My love for them is based on powerful memories, sure. Thinking back to the dedication I had as a 10-year-old freezing at my first Bears game. But it's also based on hope for the future. 
even if another Super Bowl isn't in the cards, I'd settle for a win over the Packers. <laughs>Hi, everybody. Um, before I go into my story, there is a concept relevant to it that needs explaining. In certain circles of Orthodox Judaism, when young people date, it is solely for the purpose of meeting a future spouse. Um, and the way that is usually done is through a matchmaker, like in Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> Um, a matchmaker can be a friend, a relative, an aunt, a cousin, anybody who sets you up with someone and you go out on a date, they can be your matchmaker. Or you can use a professional matchmaker, which is someone who has successfully paired many people together, tens, dozens, hundreds. Um, there's quite an incentive in Judaism. If you successfully pair three people, three matches, you are guaranteed entrance into heaven. So. Pretty big incentive there to match people up. Um, so by the time I was 26 years old, which in those circles is getting on in years to still be single, um, I was really sick of getting set up on failed matches. Um, most of the time it was matchmakers who had never even met me before. It was someone who my mother knew from someone else and they read what I was, you know, looking for in a husband, and they said, oh, here's somebody. And it was, you know, I have a blog full of horror stories <laughs> from these dates that I went on. Um, so at one point, I said to my parents, I'm going on a strike. I'm on a dating strike. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to take a break. Uh, my mom was less than happy because, again, I was getting on in years. <laughs> my dad knew better than to argue. Um, after a few weeks of this strike, my mom cautiously approached me and she said, listen, a family relative who knows the whole, we know very well, she knows you pretty well, she has a suggestion for you. He's Israeli, he's a medical student in Italy, he's doing medical school in Italian, and he checked all, a lot of my boxes and a lot of my mother's boxes, which in itself was rare. <laughs> So I said, okay, fine, I will be in touch with him. We later found out that this relative's husband thought that we would be a terrible match because our families were so different, such different backgrounds, and this couldn't possibly work. Well, somebody got the last laugh on that one. <laughs> um, so we started emailing and then uh, Facebooking, and eventually, this is how old the story is, we would Skype. And we Skyped for three months. He was in Italy, I was in Chicago. And we Skyped for three months, going back and forth. Um, and then eventually, I moved back to Israel. Um, and we decided, you know, he said he was coming to Israel to visit his family. And I said, okay, so, you know, it's time to meet in person. This was the worst first date I had ever been on. <laughs> because this was a in-the-flesh person. I couldn't just make up a lame excuse and turn off the computer and go about my life. I had to actually engage with this person. And we sat down to you know, have lunch together and I could see the wheels turning in his head. Okay, topics of conversation. Um, okay, and he would ask a question and it would be a one-worded answer. And I was just fuming at, like, you know, within myself, like this is such a disaster. I don't want to be here. This is, I'm done, I don't want this. And he was trying so, so hard. And I said, I, I went home that night and I said to my sisters, I, 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 I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. It was awful. It was literally the first worst date I've ever been on. And they said to me, you have never, in the eight years you've been dating and going on matchmaker dates, you have never given anybody three months of your time. Never mind that it was on Skype. Three months? You gave this guy three months. You owe it to yourself to see it through just a little bit more. See where it goes. It was one date in person. So we kept going out for that week he was there. And later on in the week, I said to him, listen, we don't know where this is going, but my parents are visiting Israel soon, and your parents live here. If you know, later on we decide to get engaged, I think it would be good for our parents to have met 
before the engagement party. And he's like, yeah, that makes sense. Well, my parents, being from you know the background we are and all that, were convinced we were going to announce our engagement that night. And I was like, no, 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 I just want you to meet his parents. I don't even need to be there. I don't need to see him. I'm not even sure we're gonna keep going, but you should meet his parents. And they were like, why? <laughs> like, just me, let's just do it, you never know. So they met and it was great, everybody got along. It was actually kind of funny because his parents don't speak English and my parents' Hebrew is laughable. So <laughs> it was quite funny um, when that happened. Um, he went back to Italy to finish school and a month later I went out to visit him. And again, we had a two day adjustment period of getting comfortable with each other again. Um, a month after that, um, my dad told me that he had invited him to our house for Passover without asking me, which is typical of my dad to do something like that. Um, so he came and we were 25 people for that holiday, cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody was there and everybody was sure he was gonna propose. I mean, he flew all the way from Italy. It was his first time in the States. He was coming to see me. There's gotta be a ring involved, right? No. <laughs> So my aunt, not so subtly, you know, pointed to her finger like, is he gonna propose? And I said, no. <laughs> and her jaw hit the floor so um, obviously <laughs> that he took her aside and quietly explained to her that he would do it when he felt the time was right. Which was very unusual because, you know, he's Israeli, but to the point where like, you know, he, he doesn't do things because people pressure him to do it. He's like, I will do it in my own time. And my family's like, but you're here, you must propose. And he was like quietly telling them, lay off the pressure. I'll do it when I'm ready. Um, so later on in that holiday, it was Friday the 13th. And in Judaism, that is not a bad luck number or a day, 13 is actually good luck. Uh, he got down on two knees and he proposed to me without a ring, but you know, he said he, it felt right to him. The time felt right. I think he came to the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he proposed and I said yes. And um, that was 10 years ago. And we now have two beautiful children, um, a sassy daughter who is scarily like him in his, her attitude and personality and behavior. And, my, a son who is just like me, unfortunately for him. Um, and I am still waiting for my husband to get down on one knee like everybody else and propose properly. Hi, everybody. Let's see if I'm coordinated enough to do this. And maybe. Okay. Um, <clears throat> drops of water slammed against my forehead and chest when I was aroused from my sunbathing. It was the kind of summer day that even with your eyes closed, it still felt like you were squinting. The only relief from that kind of solar assault was the occasional cloud crossing across the sky, quietly nudging you into shadows for a few seconds. It wasn't until I felt the drops that I knew something was different. I looked up, rubbing my eyes like a cartoon character after a nap, and there was my sister, backlit from the sun's rays with a smile on her face, her wet hair dripping and creating scattered showers above my towel. Get up, Beavis, she said. Her nickname for me, <clears throat> I promptly said, what the hell, man? <laughs> I said, trying to play it cool, all while screaming in my head that I needed to check my disc man for possible water damage. <laughs> Come sit with us, she motioned over to her college friends that she brought on our vacation, our family vacation. And do what, I asked, while eyeing the empty pool chair next to them while simultaneously shifting my weight uncomfortably on the concrete pool deck. Don't make it weird, get up, she said. <laughs> she said flatly, reached out her hand. My sister and I have a bit of an age difference, almost 10 years. Um, oops, lost my place. <laughs> one, one can only imagine how much of a disconnect there was between us considering first grade, I started first grade the same day she started freshman year of high school. We navigated our family life together, but barely. Uh, she was always able to leave with her friends if our parents fought, but I was usually stuck there. Often it would come to me wishing a neighborhood friend would call and ask me to come play. In some cases, I would just text my, or not text, I would call my best friend next door and ask her to call me right back, so my parents would think it was an impromptu invite. 
We both did what we had to do to survive in a time where there was very little opportunity for escapism. The internet was only in its infancy at this point, so there was a lot of breeding involved. There was hardly any speaking about it between us. Our parents fighting was not something you talked about out loud. Not with your friends, not with, your, not with our parents, and certainly not with each other. In the 90s, everything was perfect all the time, everywhere, at least to our friends and our neighbors. When she left for college, I was in fifth grade. There was not much, not much to it. We moved her into the dorm and then waved goodbye. We weren't really a touchy-feely family. It was fun at first, being the newly appointed only child, but that quickly waned. Eventually, middle school and the hormonal nightmare that comes with it distracted me from most other life events. Everything was about me. I was a roller coaster of emotions, smelled like teen spirit, and desperately needed the Adidas shoes that everyone was wearing. <laughs> It was exhausting. The only consistent thing I could look forward to was our summer beach vacations. We were fortunate enough to have rich friends who would let us stay in their giant house in Charleston. The impossibly spotless house had a pool table and automatic lights in the bathrooms. These smallest amenities at that time were awesome. <laughs> While there, I would sometimes find myself checking under the couch cushions or in the tiny crack where the carpet meets the wall for just some sand brought in from the beach. I just needed to know that not everything can be perfect and clean. We all have some things we try to hide. The morning after our arrival, we ventured out to the beach only to find a red flag on the shoreline signaling rough water conditions. We had no choice but to head to the pool instead. My sister and her friends went on the offense immediately, staking a claim on some deck chairs in the best light. Mom and dad stayed under the safety of the, safety of the umbrella most of the day to avoid last year's sunburn mishap. It involves some poorly placed lattice work and, <laughs> and ultimately a tan you could play chess on. Oh I, however, to be cool and like totally annoyed by my parental units, opted for a spot on the pool deck strate strategically just far enough away from the edge of the pool. I still wanted to avoid an unplanned soaking from some overgrown child's cannonball. It happened every time. I lowered myself onto the concrete, elbows stretched back like landing gear on a plane. Once I finally got settled and managed to put, <clears throat> find a position that wasn't too uncomfortable, I settled into an afternoon of uninterrupted bliss. The new Collective Soul CD was in the disc man, <laughs> and I was ready for nothing, really. It was perfect. Once my sister disturbed my scorching summer nap and dragged me over to her friends, I began to realize something. She finally saw me as a brother, and not an annoying brother. You take the winds where you can. <laughs> she stared at me for a second and silently motioned for me to help her while she tugged on the recently vacant chair adjacent to their group. She took her spot between her friends and I took mine beside them. They already had a portable radio cranking out the hits of yesterday and the year before yesterday. <laughs> so I wrapped my disc man in my shirt and tucked it away under my chair. Our scars aligned that day and we found some common ground where we could live and express our love to each other in our own way, since we were never really taught how. That vacation, in many ways, was a turning point for me and who I would become one day. When I got back home later that week, I was armed with a little more confidence and self-esteem, but most importantly, I knew I didn't have to listen to music by myself anymore. Thank you. So I stood by the side of the remote highway, not like this, because that meant something different, but like this, with my finger pointing lazily to the dusty road as if I had totally honed this gesture in the previous five months that I'd been there. Normally it didn't take so long to even see a car, but this wasn't an especially bustling part of the country, and it was getting late in the day. At some point, a car did pull over, but they weren't going in the same direction as me, so they moved on. And I shuffled my feet in the dust, and I readjusted the straps of my backpack, which were entirely unsuited to this kind of travel. But how could I have known I'd end up here? Eventually, another car did come toward me from out of the mountains, and I really should say, it was mountain. It was one. There was only one. Uh, but came at me from the mountains, and started slowing down, coming to a stop toward me, so I gave it once over as I approached. It was a rugged outback Jeep with a burly, stubbled man talking animatedly on the phone at the wheel. And as I got closer, I saw a raccoon tail hanging from the rearview mirror. 
And is that a crocodile Dundee hat in the back seat? What am I getting into? But I climbed up there, and he didn't get off the phone, but he asked me where I was going. I said, Kiryat Shmona, and off we went. I probably should have been a lot more wary as a 22-year-old woman getting into the car of a stranger in a foreign country. But love makes you stupid. <laughs> so I'd been in Israel for five months on a work-study program to learn the language and learn the culture, and I was traveling around, and I had fallen hard every single Random encounter felt gilded with meaning and cosmic connection. Every halfway beautiful thing was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. One mountain was suddenly an entire mountain range. And I believed that every single person I met was obviously kind and honest and had only my best interests at heart. Stupid. So here I am in a stranger's car on my way to another stranger's apartment where I'm going to couch surf for the night. The guy gets off the phone and he starts asking me the usual questions all in Hebrew. And at this point in my trip, I had become really practiced at answering these questions. Where are you from? Where are you going? What are you doing here? So I sounded a lot more uh, fluent than I actually was. So when I said that I was American, the guy said, Lo nachon, no way, you're not Israeli, are you Jewish? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I knew you did. He said, ah, mishpacha, family. He then continued speaking in rapid fire Hebrew, telling me some kind of story about how he or his brother was trying to get into the US, but they couldn't get a visa because they were a balaganist, a troublemaker. I don't know, I could only follow about 60% of what he was saying, and had I not been so in love with the world, I probably would have been a little more scared. <laughs> but finally he asked me where he should drop me off, and I said, eh, just the entrance of town. Kiryat Shmona is not a big town, it's very walkable, and I had no idea where I was actually going, so I'm like, yeah, just drop me off at the entrance of town, and I'll figure it out from there. He's like, no, 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 no. So he, uh, went so far as to ask for directions, not once but twice, from passers-by on the sidewalk to get me as close as he could to where I needed to go. He stops the car, he gives me his phone number, and he says, call me if you have any trouble with this guy or if you have trouble getting to Haifa tomorrow. At least I think that's what he said. And, and he lets me go, and I like climb down from the Jeep and find my way up a winding path to this couch surfing host's apartment. That night we made stir fry together and he regaled me with stories of his own hitchhiking adventures where he actually uh, coordinated a, um, a competition to see which team could hitchhike the furthest throughout the country with no other means of transportation. We were all stupid. <laughs> uh, so that night I slept on his lumpy futon and made it to Haifa the next day without issue. And I wrapped up my travels in Israel. A few days later, I was on a plane going over the Atlantic, going back to Wisconsin, where the Packers are. <laughs> back to normalcy. I'm married to a Bears fan, I really can't talk. <laughs> And for months after that trip, I pined for the place with the generous strangers and the extended family and everything that was beautiful. And a decade later, more than a decade later, I know that right here is exactly where I'm meant to be. This is my home. But I'll never see a Jeep again without thinking of a dusty road in the mountains and a smiling balaganist at the wheel. Thank you. It wasn't that I didn't like period five. They were an okay group. They just weren't all that into school. <laughs> the ringleader was a kid named Marcus. Every day, Marcus would come to my class late and empty handed. I'd open the door for him and he'd immediately head over to the wrong seat. I would say, Marcus, please take your seat. And he'd say, this is my seat, Ms. O'Day. <laughs> I'd say, Marcus, your seat is here, pointing to the one in the front near me. Marcus would say, okay, 
and he would get up and he'd slam the desk and he'd say, hey, do you have a piece of paper? And I'd say, yes, and I'd give him a piece of paper and then he'd say, do you have a pencil? And I'd sigh and I'd give him a pencil and he'd say, do you have a copy of the book? <laughs> and I'd give him a copy of the book. And then he would say, what page are we on? So I would open the book and I would point to the section. Five minutes in, he'd be asleep. I admit, I did not always wake him. That kid's just a goof, said Connie Chikowsky. And she knew because she was the assistant to the disciplinarian. She really knew Marcus. But I have to tell you, Marcus was more than just a goof. I learned this one day when I discovered a hand-drawn map under his desk. X marked the spot where, and I quote, the dude with the weed will meet us, <laughs> according to an arrow. And so then, maybe a week later, I'm walking past the parking lot, and who do I see? But Marcus and his buddies partaking of said weed, presumably from said dude. And of course, all of his friends just run when they see me, but not Marcus. He sees me and says, hi, Ms. O'Day, how's it going? <laughs> But all that said, Marcus was not a bad kid. He was actually really smart. He loved to read. He even had good things to say in class when he was awake. I, I knew that I was just never going to change him. I was never going to change Marcus. I was never going to change period five. So I, I just settled on trying to keep things as nice as possible. I even went so far as bribing them with a movie. <laughs> and you know what? It worked. At the end of the semester, I was thrilled to discover that not only had they read The Catcher in the Rye, but most of them had actually written a paper on the subject. I was just celebrating this minor victory when it appeared in my inbox, the dreaded teacher observation notice for period five. Please understand, I was already on thin ice with administration. Earlier, with a better class, I'd gotten a basic rating because some of my students hadn't raised their hands. I had to raise my rating, though, because I was untenured. This could mean the end of my job. But how? How could I possibly raise my rating with this group of hooligans? Simple, bribery again. <laughs> this time, it was extra credit. Every student who behaves well will receive 10 points of extra credit, and every student who raises their hand three times might even receive a little bit more. <laughs> so the day of the observation came, and I stood there before period five, wearing my one pantsuit, <laughs> my learning objective on the board behind me. Oh yeah, That's right. I looked out at them, and it was like I was looking at a new class. Who were these kids? Nobody was talking, nobody was whispering. Every time I asked a question, every hand shot up. I'm feeling pretty good. And then I realized someone's missing. Someone's not here. And then I thought, maybe Marcus decided to cut today. No. 10 minutes in, he slides next to his buddy in the back, right next to him. Now, to give his friend credit, he did not respond to Marcus. He just looked straight forward and kind of shook his head like, mm, not right now, not now. No. So Marcus looks around, and then he sees the observer, who amazingly hadn't caught his late arrival because she was checking out my bulletin board. So he sees the observer, and then he looks at me. And suddenly, Marcus becomes another kid. He sits up straight. He does something I've never seen him ever do. He raises his hand. And he says, um, excuse me, Ms. O'Day. Uh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but could you just remind me of the name of the book that we're reading right now? <laughs> I, said, I said, certainly, Marcus. It's Black Boy by Richard Wright. And he's like, oh, of course, of course. You told us that last month during Salinger. He said, is, is this going to be a coming of age book as well? <laughs> and I said, why, yes, it is, as a matter of fact. And he said, oh, well, I thought so. He said, I'm, I'm, I, I don't mean to ask to bother you again, but 
I wasn't in class yesterday, and so I, I missed your book distribution. May I, may I please have a copy of the book? <laughs> so I said, certainly, and I had it in that copy. Let me tell you, this show went on for the whole class, <laughs> whole time. Everybody behaved so well, and Marcus was the star of the show. Every single time he could, he raised his hand and he offered some incredible insight about the text. He even made connections to things I'd taught months before while I thought he was asleep. <laughs> He'd say again and again, Ms. O'Day, I remember when you taught me. By the end of class, I'm gonna cry. Oh. By the end of class, my heart was swelling with gratitude. I didn't know it then, but that was the last time I would ever see Marcus. His uh, parents had decided to give up on trying to keep him in control, and so they sent him off to Texas to live with relatives. And so that was the very last time I saw him. Um, I did receive an email from him about a year later asking for book recommendations. He, was, he said that he, was still, he still hated school, but that that was not going to stop him from reading. Thank you. the question I'm asking you. This two-soled flesh is always going to run. The question I'm asking you is what do you call a group of runners? A team? A field? What about a yellow line of Swifters? <laughs> when I first encountered the Skokie Swifters, I was looking for a running club to join. I had ran cross country and track in college, and then I joined corporate America and slowly died on the inside. And I was looking for some kind of community that wasn't soulless. And so I was looking for running clubs, and I had been a part of a few since uh, over the years. A few that were really serious, super hyper competitive, and that's just what, what I wasn't looking for at this point in my life. And then I was also, I joined a few that were, they didn't have a nucleus. They didn't have camaraderie. They were just very loose, and there was nothing holding them together at all. And so I was lonely. And there's a book that is shibboleth amongst the running community, the distance running community. It's called The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. But let's be real. Lon loneliness is a lot more romantic in things like The Catcher in the Rye and literature <laughs> overall. So. I found the Skokie Swifters one day while I was scrolling on the app Strava. Just look, quick context, if you're not on Strava, Strava is a social media app. It's essentially Facebook for runners and cyclists to upload their, their runs and rides to people who actually care. Um, <laughs> so they don't clog your Facebook or Instagram feed. Um, and so I was scrolling and then I saw that the Swifters had a group page on Strava. So I clicked on it. And then I saw that they had a challenge. And that challenge was called the Creepy Carousel. And I was like, I'm interested. Tell me more. <laughs> so I scrolled. And basically, the challenge was this. You go run to this spot, and then you run around in a circle, and whoever runs around this area called the creepy carousel the most, because there's literally a creepy carousel in someone's yard, take a picture, prove you were there, and boom, you'll win. <laughs> and I was like, OK, that sounds fun. I'm in. So I put on my running shoes. And it was only two miles away, so I ran there. And then I was like, I'm on my long run. So I ran seven miles in a circle <laughs> around the same tiny block. So I hope no neighbors saw me. Uh, I promise I was not casing the joint. And so I got home, uploaded my GPS data, jumped to the top of the leaderboard on the Strava page, <laughs> uploaded the picture, threw some deuces up, and said, now it's your turn, Skokie Swifters. And I was like, no one's going to beat that. I just ran seven miles on like a .3 block. No one's going to beat that. So I go to bed. And then when I wake up in the morning, some dude named Max ran eight miles <laughs> at like four in the morning. <laughs> and I have to admit, I was impressed. And so I had to explain to my wife why I was mad. And I had to explain what the creepy carousel was. And it was about as difficult as it is right now to explain to you what it is. And so I put on my running shoes and I said, well, I'm going to go run seven more miles around this person's house. 
And she goes, out of the 8,900,000 people that live in all of Chicago metropolitan area, I married you. And I said, I love you. And then I ran seven miles around someone's house. And I came home. And then I went to bed. And then I woke up. And Max had run another eight miles at four in the morning. And I got to admit, I, that's the kind of pettiness and discipline that I really respect in life. And so we went back and forth for a whole month, just running around this person's house that had a carousel in their yard. And it pains me to admit, but I lost. Um, no, I'm kidding. Props to Max, because we averaged about 100 miles in total by the end of the month around this person's house. So I think we both, well, you could say that maybe we both won or we both lost. Depends how you look at it. But anywho, so I decided at the end of this, this endeavor, I need to go show my face. I just trolled a whole running community on Strava. I should probably go meet them in person. So I go, to, uh, I go to Sketchbook to meet them. The Skokie Swifters meet 6 p.m. every Tuesday at Sketchbook. That's not a paid endorsement. Them's is just the facts. And so I got out of the car, I walked up, I said hey to people, They're like, oh wow, they were really nice for like some guy who just creepily trolled them on a social media app for a month. And they were really cool. Um, but then uh, the person who's in charge, who goes by Captain Swifter, uh, she was inside, and because I was wondering why we we're waiting to go run, because we're all standing around. They're like, she comes out, she gives some announcements, and then we go running. And I kid you not, she comes out of sketchbook a few minutes later in an inflatable shark suit. Just kind of. <laughs> and then she kind of talks to some people, and then she points at me with a little shark fin, just like this. Goes, you must be John. And I said, yeah. And who am I to judge what people identify as? You want to like dress up as a shark? That's all good. And so then we then we went running down the Skokie Valley Trail. And we were chatting, and it was really great. I was like, these are my people. They are heavy drinkers with a running problem. That's awesome. <laughs> and then I found out it was also Discovery Channel Shark Week. So that made the shark suit make a lot more sense. So we get back to Sketchbook, and then, we, then I meet Mama Swifter. And she's like the den mother of the group. And she has made deviled eggs and macaroni pasta salad. And there's all other kinds of hors d'oeuvres. And then there's shark trivia and raffle prizes. And let me tell you, all of this is free. It is still free. The Skokie Swifters is a free running club. Not a paid endorsement, just facts. And so I got to walking around and schmoozing and talking to everyone, and I realized, like, wow, this is a really diverse and inclusive group, and they're very welcoming, because not everyone in the Skokie Swifters is a tried and true runner. Some are walkers, some are skateboarders, and some people don't even run. I think they just show up to eat Mama Swifter's deviled eggs. <laughs> I would too, the deviled eggs are really good, I'm just saying. And so, not only is it a run, walk, skateboard, deviled egg club, it's also a community service club. It's also a wear your ugly Christmas sweater and run around to other breweries in Skokie and Evanston club. It's also a go on vacation together club. And it's also probably a slumber party club and I think two people just found love, so that's good. Um, so yeah. I think I love the Skokie Swifters. So, when I say stay, you say Swifty. Stay. Swifty. Stay. Swifty. Stay. Swifty. Thank you. Uh, hail to you guys, Swifters. But when your knees give out, get on your bike and Skokie Bike Network. We're with you, bro. We are on a family vacation in Florida, staying at a cottage in a row of thinly walled cottages that are intimate with one another, <laughs> to the point where we can tell when our neighbors are being intimate with one another. <laughs> My wife, Ellen, is taking some much needed she time and is going for a run or a walk on the beach while well, I am having a shared pleasure with my six-year-old daughter, Emily. We are on the couch watching Pee Wee's Playhouse <laughs> while her two-year-old sister, Jenny, is still asleep. Jenny awakes 
in a torrent of screams and cries, and she's inconsolable, and she can get that way. And it unnerves me because I don't seem to have the gift that the jogger on the beach has to be able to calm her out of the terrors of babyhood and toddlerhood. It is more than a minute, less than a minute, through Pee Wee when Emily is giving me the stink eye to do something about said childhood terrors. And so I go in and I start to work through the pages of the parental handbook. I check the diaper and I change it just because. I give her her sippy cup. I brought some Cheerios. I gave her some Cheerios to eat. I read her a story. I sing her songs. I tell her jokes. We do Grandpa Charlie math. Jenny, if Grandpa Charlie has two cookies and he eats one of them, how many cookies does, she ha does he have? To which she answers, screaming bloody murder, not giving the correct answer. He has three cookies because he took your two. <laughs> and she's using all the stamina that she uses, will use in the, in the future years when she's on the soccer field. But now, she's not doing me any good. And so I just hold her. I hold her and try and let her know that I love her. I try and hold her and calm her down, and she's having none of it. And the thing is, Jenny can never be calmed down by external forces. Her older sister, Emily, Emily could be calmed down by her fuzzy puppy or her thumb. Yes, she was a thumb sucker, but that thumb gave her solace in moments when she was just outside of herself, and that thumb also helped her at a very precocious age to learn left from right, because she knew that the right one, she was a righty, was the one she stuck in her mouth, and the left, well, that was just the other one. But we would give Jenny a stuffed animal, and she'd look at us as if to say, what am I supposed to be doing with that? I'm busy crying here. And she did that with gusto. And then finally, after a little over a half hour, she just ran out of gas. And without acknowledging me or what's been going on for the past 30 minutes, she gets out of bed and walks into the living room and sits next to her sister and starts watching cartoons. <laughs> I walk into the room and sit next to the two of them, and that is when we hear a knock at the door. I open the door to find two gentlemen in starched khaki shorts, starched white shirts with stars on them, and leather belts that have all the accoutrement of their trade. And one of them looks at me and says, Sir, has there been a child in distress? <laughs> and I think to myself, I haven't been doing too well this morning. And I don't have a lot of confidence. And I'm the potential child abuser. I don't have a lot of credibility here. So I played the only card that I thought I had. I relied on a kindergartner. Emily? Can you tell the officer what's been going on this morning? And Emily looks at me, and she looks at the officer, and she looks back at me, and I motion for her. And she kind of stands up a little straighter, and she puts her hands on her hips, and she goes, well, Jenny must have woken up on the wrong side of the bed. <laughs> because she woke up, and she just started crying, and she wouldn't shut up. And so Daddy went in and tried to do something about it, and she still wouldn't shut up. Finally, after a whole episode of Pee Wee, Jenny finally shut up. And she's okay now, aren't you, Jenny? And Jenny nodded her head up and down. And the officer looked at me, and he wasn't a Barney Fife. He looked like he you know, had some experience in his trade. And he sized up the situation. He realized the children were just fine. The parent, not so much. 
And he looked at me and said, well, sir, we had a report of a child in distress. And things look like they're all right now, so thank you, sir. And the two of them left. Now, emboldened by her turn as her father's advocate, <laughs> Emily's barking out orders. Daddy, Jenny and I are hungry. I think it's time for breakfast. So I comply. <laughs> I'm in the kitchen. I'm cutting uh, fruit and putting in cereal and milk in a bowl. And that's when mom finally comes in from her time on the beach. And Emily, who although she has done a fine job as her father, the attorney's attorney, she hasn't quite learned the rules of attorney-client privilege and blurts out, Mommy, Mommy, the police came. <laughs> but it's okay, I handled it. <laughs> I'm on vacation. I haven't even had a cup of coffee yet. And I've already been busted <laughs> twice. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was so nice. Oh, good. Perfect. Well done. Hi, everybody. Hi. What a fun night. This is awesome. All right. I was in the Netherlands with my husband, and it seemed only fitting that we should rent a tandem bike. <laughs> we were, after all, in the country that cycles, celebrating our wedding anniversary. And so, and because renting a tandem had been on his bucket list for a long while, uh, and up until then, I'd usually put the brakes on it. Things like, the streets are too slick. Visibility's too, too low. It's too cold. Too hot. Despite the tendonitis in my foot and my claustrophobia in crowds, I gave it the green light because bicycling is David's second love, or so he claims. No matter what the occasion or the weather, he'll always choose the bike over any other mode of transportation. Let's ride our bikes to the wedding! You won't even notice the sleet if you're covered in waterproof, breathable outerwear. <laughs> I do enjoy a bike ride, but I don't live for it like he does. However, I was running out of reasons to resist, and I knew it would make him happy. Seeing his blue, sky blue eyes twinkle and his cheeks turn red is something that I do live for. On a bike, he's the embodiment of joy, and it's infectious, and it reminds me of why I need him in my life. But his proclivity for propulsion and mine to park <laughs> are among the top tensions between us. He's always been a body in motion, forever pushing forward. In those first minutes on the bike, balanced and upright, I leaned to the right to save my bum left foot, but he leaned to the left. We were centimeters from toppling, but he swiftly shifted his weight, and with some quick settling steps, upright we stayed. This was gonna be harder than I thought. I hadn't anticipated how heavy a double-seated bicycle would be, especially with two grown adults trying to balance on it. I've always liked how easy and fluid biking can be. A subtle lean can initiate a turn. When you get into a rhythm, it can feel like an extension of your body. Not so much, though, when a lefty is the captain and a right-hander is the stoker and both like being in control. <laughs> especially when one of the riders has a bad foot and navigating in urban areas means stopping at intersections, stabilizing the bike with her good foot. When David and I started dating in the early 1980s, I liked that he had a lot going on in his life and that he valued self-sufficiency. We were together, but also independent. He was also frenetic, whizzing, from class to delivering pizza to going to a softball game and making it to an evening concert, often all in one day, all on his bike. 
My main form of exercise was a weekly yoga class, walks at lunch hour, moving my hands around a computer keys, and worrying. <laughs> I was a worrier, still am. Which is what I was doing as we left the charming city of Harlem and crisscrossed the streets to the sea. I hadn't counted on not seeing anything in front of me, aside from his back. My grip on the handlebars tightened because even though I trust my husband, he can be clumsy. But since he navigates city traffic on a regular basis and he was wearing his prescription sunglasses, I took a deep breath and tried to let go of the worry, not the handlebars. <laughs> we were starting to get into a rhythm when we came to a stop by, the, by a four-lane highway. David saw an opening for us to get across two lanes to the divider, but neglected to tell me. Before I knew it, he was pedaling us into the street, and as I hopped on my good foot to keep up, cars were honking at us and giving us stink eye until we safely reached the middle. We'd been canoeing, but unlike that cooperative venture in which the person at the bow and stern help one another steer, tandem biking was clearly more of a master-slave scenario. <laughs> My only job was to let him lead, and I was only going to let him do that for so long. Once we got beyond the enchanting Dutch residential area and into the country, I began to accept that I would be taking in the sights sideways. I could close my eyes and still move forward as, as he determined the pace. Like his general demeanor, it was steady. It was just up to me to keep up with it. My pedaling could add or take away power. So I experimented with this because that's what I do. <laughs> hey, you're pedaling anxiously. Stay mindful of your cadence, E, he said firmly but calmly, remembering that I respond best when he speaks in a non-accusatory tone. <laughs> what do you mean, anxiously? You're overexpending your energy. You'll tire out. See if you can settle into my pace. Suddenly he stopped. Ah, you need to tell me when you're stopping. Sorry, 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 my shoelace got tangled up. We need a safe word. Give me a safe word. How about stopping? <laughs> Fine. The breeze picked up by the sea. The sun shone over spectacular rolling scenery in perfect upper 60 degree temperatures. Knowing he was happy and doing most of the heavy pedaling, I just hadn't felt that relaxed in a really, really long time. I was actually enjoying this. Like Chicago, where we live and bike, the Netherlands are flat. But like our city, there are a few hills. So a slight incline appeared and threw us off pace. I called out, stopping, and shimmied off the bike and watched as he regained his balance. I needed a break anyway. I stood for a moment and watched him pedal up the hill. I took in the sea and sand that spanned in front, the hobbit-like cottages behind. Over the course of our almost 40 years together, we have both needed breaks. When our daughters were young, I stole riding weekends in Wisconsin and Michigan. He rode the AIDS ride from Minneapolis to Chicago and took week-long bike rides with his buddies. We needed that time because there were some seriously derailing years. But luckily, the topography does not stay the same for long. Our daughters had graduated from college and were now working and living full lives. We had just paid off the final school loan. Our youngest was engaged. I turned 60. We hadn't been on a two-week vacation, just us, ever. That's when I planned this trip, which took much discussion and a lot of compromise. David had a few stipulations, as good attorneys do, as long as we selected a place where he could ride that also had art and culture, as long as we kept to a budget, got a good airfare, and an affordable Airbnb. After a delightful lunch on the beach, we got back onto our two-seater, and my logical Boy Scout planning husband said, let's try a different route back. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, as long as the sun is at our back, 
I know we're heading east. You sure? You don't want to look at a map? Nope, I'm good. This trip had been about making new memories together. All those rotations had amounted to something. About half of our married friends are still together. The other half are divorced, widowed, or choose to be single. My parents went their separate ways just before the 30-year mark. I know that we were lucky to have found one another. Lots of people love each other, but whatever it is that makes one relationship work longer than another is really a mystery to me. We were getting close to the rental shop, relying on street signs, when suddenly I had the urge, the urge to pick up my feet and position them on the steering stem. Once balanced, I stretched out my arms like Kate Winslet did when she was secured by Leonardo DiCaprio at the bow of the Titanic and hummed the opening bars of My Heart Will Go On. Oh. <laughs> we came close several times, but we never fell over. Einstein wrote that people are like bicycles. To keep balance, People need to keep moving. But balance also involves the ability to remain still. If you wobble in the seat as the bike is moving, the whole thing can topple over. And if you don't pull over every once in a while and take a break, then all you are, are ex is exhausted. When we pulled up to the shop, soaked in sweat and a tad saddle so sore, the bike chain imprinting on his calf, my ankle bleeding from being nicked by a sharp bike part, and my foot was sore. We took a sigh of relief. But on the train back to Amsterdam, tired but safe in my seat, I told my husband that if I were to suddenly die that night in my sleep, he should know that it was um, a perfect day. Thank you. <laughs> So some of you may not know this, but about three miles to the south of here is a place where I was born. It's the Salvation Army Hospital called Booth Memorial. It's a hospital for unwed mothers. And I was born there in 1948. It's at 4747 West Peterson in Chicago. Now, um, my mother was very stubborn, and uh, she came down from Canada, and she's what is known as an urban missionary. And my father says, okay, you're done with all that missionary stuff. I'm from Chicago, and you're going to marry me, and you're going to settle down. And she said, uh, if you think I'm going to settle down and not be an urban missionary, you've got another thing coming. And so she took a bus to go to the Booth Memorial Hospital and pick me up and bring me home. Now, my father uh, already, he and, he and my mother already had a birth son, and so I was the second son. Okay, so we moved to North Lake shortly after I was brought into the home. And my father had a very... Um, he had a very mean way of taking care of dis discipline. Okay, so we had chores, and, and the chore between my brother and I was doing the dishes. So we would clean our rooms and do all these nice, neat sorts of things, but if my dad had an attitude toward one of us, when it wasn't my turn, if he told me to do the dishes, that meant that I was to stand there at the sink and do dishes until he decided to come up and hit me, okay? So, um, I, always, I always wondered, why, why am I different? Why am I so different from my, my, my brother? And it turned out that when I was 12 years old, they told me that I was adopted. I had no idea that I was adopted. And uh, so, my, my father walks up and he hands me the 
amended birth certificate and he leaves the room. And my mother says, well, you know, your birth mother was really nice, I met her. I said, what? You met her? What was she like? Why didn't she keep me? Is God mad at me? What's going on? And this never really got decided, and so I decided to drop it. And okay, so years later, I'm 21 years old, and I get married. And a year later, we have twins. My, my, my wife and I had twins. And when my twins had problems, they were in ICU for three weeks. They had problems breathing. And that's when I decided, I don't care what it takes, I'm going to find my birth family because I want to know what's going on for them. I, didn't, I, I couldn't really open up and say, and I want to find out what's going on for me. Well, so about five years after that, my kids are in the clear. And I decided, heck with it, I am going to find my birth parents. And so I had a really terrific uh, graduate professor. She was my favorite. Her name is Cordelia Mayberry, and she did the smoothest thing. How many, how many people in the room are educators, teachers, professionals? OK. All right. So we were at Elgin Asylum. This is one of the craziest places on earth. And, and they were teaching graduate students how to get their master's degree to hold on to professionals and have them know how to run um, classrooms and how to handle patients. So we're sitting there, and there's a, there's a bunch of us sitting in a semicircle. And this woman walks in, and she had a house coat on, uh, one of those 1950s house coats. And she had a tooth missing. And she was tan like she had been out in the sun for years. And she walks by, and she picks up a cigarette butt, and she walks back in the back of the classroom, and she sits down. Now, I happen to be farthest away from her, and I have really good peripheral vision. And so we, whenever we mentioned Cordelia Mayberry, her eyes kind of lit up. Her eyes kind of lit up. I said to my buddy, I said, do not say anything more about Cordelia Mayberry, because she's right there. He goes, you're kidding me. No, 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 no. That couldn't be her. That couldn't be her. She walks up in front of class, and she tells me, us that she's the professor. I took 16 hours in graduate school with this woman. So one day she says, you know, you told me that your adoption agency, Illinois Children's Home and Aid Society, um, well, anyway, they're having a meeting, and you, you're, you're going to do your thesis on adoption, right? I said, yeah, because I don't know how to search for my birth parents. This is no internet, no, no DNA stuff, none of it. So I go to this meeting, and it was like, it was like January 6th inside. She's standing up there as an adult who happened to be adopted, and she was in favor of adults having open records so that you can identify the medical problems that you're having with your kid, like mine. I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting for this woman to start speaking, and all of a sudden, somebody started yelling at her, and two people got up, one in each aisle, and they started marching right toward her, and I'm like over there someplace. And I stood up and I said, help me understand. The law says that if you come out of a medical hospital or if you come out of a psychiatric hospital, all you have to do is pay for the records and you can get any piece of paper that was written about you. I said, not only that, but in prisons, when you come out of prisons, you can get any records. Why is it, here I am, I'm an adult, adopt, adult who happens to be adopted, my kids had problems. They were in ICU for three weeks. I can't even get my records. What's with that? The crowd fell silent. Mrs. Cohn comes up afterwards, and she says, would you be a part of our organization yesterday's children? Well, that got some attention. And I was on this program called Two on Two with Walter Jacobson. Now, that got some attention. And I, would, I spoke at a whole bunch of conferences, and I was able to find out from the people that I network with across the country. I found my, my birth mother's name. I found out that she was from Massachusetts, and she graduated from Skidmore Nursing School. Put that together with a bunch of other stuff. Ba-boom, I find her. I call her up. It was among the most beautiful 31 minutes in my whole life speaking to my birth mother. I said, you know, I got cast in a play. Why don't you come to Chicago? You know, you, you can 
we could spend some time together. She lived in Marietta, Georgia. I said, I said, I'm six feet one. I'm going to be wearing a a, a navy blue anti nuke T-shirt, and um, and she said she was going to wear a navy blue blazer. So um, so I go to the airport, and I've got laser focus, and I'm waiting for her to come in, and I see the jet pull up. And I'm waiting for the door to open. And all of a sudden, this this figure comes up to me. And she looks down at me and she goes, I took an earlier flight. And I swear to you, when I was looking up, I saw my eyes for the first time since I was eight days old. And it was as if she could cradle me and pick me up. I've never had a feeling like that. Even, even when I was holding my own babies on my chest, I didn't have a feeling so close to heaven as that. So she comes to see me in a play. And uh, um, this is the letter. I'm going to read you. Uh, just it's the note. It's part of the classes. The classes. Okay. This is a, a portion of the letter that she she wrote to me. She says, "My dear, just a reminder that you have brought much joy into my life." For me, my favorite part of our relationship is the communication that I experienced even during our very first phone call. It is important for me to cherish our unique relationship. My love for you is very real. Um, and Miriam died in 2005. Thank you very much. The title of this is Meeting Judy, and that's Judy. In March of 1969, that's before almost all of you were born, <laughs> things were finally looking up for me. It had been almost two years since I received my degree in electrical engineering from the University of Wisconsin. And Anne, if you think it was easy being a Bears fan there, <laughs> I got news. But I had loans to pay and parents, a blessed memory now, who needed my help. So I moved back into their house in Skokie, got a job, and began taking evening courses at DePaul Law School. It didn't allow for much social life. But in less than two years, I had repaid all my loans and helped my mom and dad when they needed it most, including paying them rent to sleep in the very room that I had grown up in. With all of our family problems resolved, come fall, I had planned to move to Washington, D.C., where I got a fabulous offer from Westinghouse who not only agreed to pay me the astronomical sum of $14,000 a year to work in their patent department, but pay for my evening classes at Georgetown Law School. It was there that I planned to take courses in intellectual property law, which back then weren't offered at DePaul or almost anywhere else. In April, Ernie Banks promised his diehard Cub fans <laughs> that the Cubs will shine in 69. <laughs> and shine they did winning 16 of 23 games that month, starting with an extra inning walk-off homer on opening day. Billy Williams. No, it was a guy named Smith, I think. Yeah. It wasn't Billy Williams. Uh, he was a lefty, anyway, it's not a <laughs> There you go. Boy, did I love that team. The Cubs winning ways continued into May and my euphoria over their success evolved into sheer giddiness. 
No matter where we were, that was all my friends and I could talk about. It was in the course of one such baseball conversation that a friend of a friend casually mentioned to me if I'd call his kid sister who had just come home from college. I did so a few days later. And so it was that on May 22, 1969, I arrived at Judy's home for our first date. I was greeted by her mom, who escorted me into the den. And the Cubs game was on the TV. <laughs> so I thought this was a good sign. <laughs> a short time later, Judy walked into the room, and it was love at first sight. Not only was she the prettiest girl I had ever seen, but she radiated a certain wholesomeness, a certain goodness, a certain strength that made me tingle inside. Conversation flowed easily as we drove downtown where we had dinner at a somewhat funky restaurant. It was her 21st birthday the next day. So at midnight, we ceremoniously burned her fake ID in an ashtray on the table. <laughs> we talked some more on the way home. And by then I felt like I had known her my whole life. Outside her drawer, we kissed, and then we kissed again. I was quite certain that Judy felt the same way about me as I did about her, and that gave me a feeling of joy that I had never experienced before. Now, it was only some time later when I learned what Judy actually told her mom when she woke up the next morning. Quote, I'm going to marry that guy. <laughs> I had gone out with countless girls, but never took one home to meet my parents. <laughs> Yet a few days after our first date, Judy spent the Memorial Day weekend with my entire family at my grandparents' summer home in Wisconsin. Well, there's that place again. <laughs> it was then that my grandmother gave me a memorable piece of advice. If you let that girl get away, you're dumber than I think you are. <laughs> But there was a problem. Judy had signed a contract to teach at a junior high in Chicago, suburb, beginning in the fall. At the same time, I was planning to continue my education at my dream school in Washington, where I had an even dreamier job at Westinghouse. It was something I had worked two long years to accomplish. What to do? Well, my grandmother was right. I wanted to spend every minute I could with Judy. And if that meant dropping out of school for a year, postponing my transfer to Georgetown, passing up the Westinghouse job, giving up the money, the perks, and the paid tuition that they offered, then so be it. It was the best decision I ever made because over 53 years later, I can still say that Judy is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> and and, and P.S., that fall, my beloved Cubs blew the pennant, <laughs> but by then, Judy and I were already making plans to get married. Made in high school is special, although it's not all that unique unless you are a heterosexual female who went to an all-girls Catholic high school. <laughs> and that is just how my love story with my fiance Connor began. Back in high school, we used to talk inside the vestibule while we were waiting to be picked up. I was waiting to be picked up because I had served one too many detentions for calling nuns inappropriate names. <laughs> and he was waiting to be picked up because he had just finished sports practice. So our priorities in high school were slightly different. I really enjoyed talking to Connor. He made me laugh, he was funny, and Every time I had those detentions, which was more often than I'd like to admit, I would hope I would see him coming around the corner. He was a scrawny little thing, and I just enjoyed talking to him. I was two years older than Connor, so I'm not really that great of an influence on him. I graduated early. 
And over the years, I had kept in touch with what he was doing with his life through a mutual friend of ours. But it took me 18 years to finally message him. So in October of 2020, I messaged him. And I didn't message him to tell him that I thought he was a little scrawny in high school and he made me laugh. <laughs> I messaged him to tell him how brave I thought he was and how proud I was of him for him living his authentic life. Connor was living his authentic life because he had transitioned from female to male and was living his life as his true identity, a heterosexual male. And Connor did this without any support of his family. And he did this with only the support of a few good friends. So a month later, it's November of 2020, and we had been talking on the phone, we texted, it was in the middle of a pandemic, nobody was gonna fly anywhere, he lived in Florida, I lived here, so we Zoomed. And again, at the Zoom, I just enjoyed talking to him. I never thought I would tell him that I thought he was a funny, scrawny one in high school. I just wanted to learn more about his story. So those three hours felt like three minutes. And after we hung up on the Zoom call, I was absolutely head over heels for Connor. I did not know what to do. I had not anticipated this. That wasn't why I messaged him. And I freaked the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> that connection in high school did mean something. So two days later, I'm in my therapist's office. <laughs> I am acting like a complete child. I am on the floor next to the radiator, a blanket covering my head, hiding this huge grin of this little girl who had their first crush. I was happy, I was giddy, I was excited. But at the same time, I had this dichotomy growing inside of me. Because what does this mean for me personally to be with somebody who's transgender? I was really confused. I've been in serious relationships before. I have never felt the spark. I have never felt those butterflies. And I have never felt the gut punch of falling in love before. In fact, I didn't think that those things were even possible. I thought it was something people said. I thought it was something in movies to romanticize. I didn't think it was real. And here it's real, and again, I start questioning my own self. Because what does it mean for me at 33 years of age, as a heterosexual female, to begin this journey? I became really concerned with what people would think. I became concerned with what people would think, what they would say about me, what they would think and say about Connor, and what they would think and say about us. And I'm not proud of this, but there was a time that I used to explain away his transgenderness by whether or not he's had surgeries, as if that made him more of a man to me, and if that made him more of a man to the people that I care about. And even though I was conflicted, I was embarrassed at times, there was a part of me that couldn't let him go. And I have never met a more kind, generous, loving, funny man. And let me tell you, he is very patient with me because I have some weird things. Like when it comes to food and the refrigerator, I like half the refrigerator to be mine, half the pantry to be mine. Kimberly's food, don't eat. If you eat it, don't eat the last one. <laughs> right? He loves me for it. He doesn't care. He respects that. Maybe you find it a little endearing. I'm not sure. But then, you know, there's times that I get really sad and I think about what I could have missed out on had I let that fear of the unknown, the scariness of changing the way that I think and I, my life and how I lived it, then I could have missed out on some things. 
something really great. I've grown a lot. And although at once I'm ashamed that I was embarrassed to be in love with someone who was born with the wrong anatomy, I am one of the luckiest women. And I am one of the luckiest women because I know that Connor would not be here today if it wasn't for his own resilient nature. He doesn't have a family anymore. He only has a few good friends. And I can't help but believe that whatever was in high school, whatever it was that you made me laugh, he was scrawny, I always wanted to see him. That it was meant for something bigger and better. That it was meant to teach me to step out of my comfort zone. It was meant to teach me to think differently. And it was meant to happen for him so that he could experience what true love really is, not bound by anything. True love is not bound by social norms or societal norms or gender norms. And if I had let those norms, my way of thinking, continue to guide me and never challenge them, never took a step back, I would have missed out on one of the most important things in life. And that's love and being. During my third year of college, I came home to celebrate Thanksgiving at our family home in River Forest, Illinois. I was one of nine kids, and my parents gathered the nine of us with our spouses, friends, neighbors, whoever needed a place for a Thanksgiving meal. Conversations started, tangents took over, Childhood patterns of teasing erupted. Topics were covered from the silly to the serious. It was really hard to find an opening to jump in on the conversation. Around the main table, someone posed a question over the din of the conversation. What was your favorite stuffed animal growing up? Some of my siblings knew the names and shapes and colors of all of these favorite stuffed animals. There was Squeak Bun, there was Feathers, Petey, Spunky the Funky Monkey. <laughs> my parents looked very bemused at our memories of those beloved stuffed animals as they were given to, as they had been given to us over the years. My favorite was named Dreamer. He was a fluffy, soft dog in shades of brown. He laid in a prone position with his ears flopped over. Ears, and he was large enough for me to use as a pillow every night. He lived on my bed, and he never traveled outside of our bedroom. When I was around eight years old, I came home after school and promptly went to my bedroom to chill out. Tidying up had happened since the morning when I had made my bed, arranged my pillow, arranged Dreamer, arranged all my comfortable things. But Dreamer was not on my bed then, nor under my bed, nor under my sister's bed, nor under any other beds on the second floor of that, of that house. And I said, hmm, I wonder if mom knows. Finding her in the kitchen. I asked her where Dreamer was. Who? Dreamer. You know, my stuffed animal. Oh, well, um, check in the poor box in the basement. Maybe it's there. I go, it? This was Dreamer. Didn't she know? And I panicked. So I went down to the basement and searched in the poor box. My parents were really good about cleaning out unnecessary items, and the poor people always got her stuff. I found Dreamer tucked in one of the boxes that was going to the poor people. I was heartbroken. I was stunned. I was, I was well, confused. And I thought, maybe mom thinks it was too ragged to keep. 
that it was no longer needed or forgotten about, that it took up too much room in our bedroom. Maybe mom thinks that the poor people need a dreamer more than me. Maybe it was her way of teaching me how to share my things with those who have so little. Maybe it was time for me to say goodbye. And so I did. I picked up Dreamer, and I kissed him goodbye. And I said, I hope you find someone new to love you. And that was that. Until that Thanksgiving gathering my junior year in college. I told this story about the day that my favorite stuffed animal, Dreamer, was given away to the poor people. No one remembered Dreamer. My parents' faces shifted from bemusement to utter shame. They were heartbroken. Why didn't you tell us then that this was your favorite stuffed animal? We could have taken Dreamer out of the box. I tried to lessen the sting of my story. I said, because I thought you thought it was the right thing for me to do. Because I thought you thought that it was time to give away my dreamer to someone who needed him more than I. That's what you wanted to teach me, right? It was both a yes and a no. They apologized to me right then and there that night. And that was that. Until I came home at Christmas time and we opened a bounty of presents. And my parents gave me one more gift, which I opened, and I saw, nestled in the tissue, a small, fluffy, stuffed, soft dog in shades of brown. He laid in a prone position with legs spread out, ears that flopped over his head, too small for me to use as a pillow now. I cried. They cried. My siblings laughed at us. <laughs> My parents wanted forgiveness for the transgression that I had kept hidden from them. For so many years, I never told that story to anyone until that night at Thanksgiving. And I love them for that. This was an act of love. I still have Dreamer. I keep it in a memory box as a reminder of the love that my parents showed me that Christmas day. The love that they showed me through their actions of letting go of what we really don't need. That forgiveness is a pathway to love. I dream of them often and love them for what this gift meant to them and still means to me. And that is that.